Okay, so recording has started. All right. Go ahead, Bruce. I would just like to note that today is Nagasaki Day. Can you um, explain Elab a little bit? Elaborate what that is? on why that's important because yes. Hiroshima Day was three days before it, and between the two of them, millions of people died. Um, and the use of nuclear weapons is still a possibility, and we should note that. Wow. Well, thank you for for noting that, Bruce. Um, so I'm just going to informally sort of um, welcome everyone to the, um, gosh, August 9th, 2023 Conservation Commission meeting. Our, our chairperson um, is not here this evening. And our first item of business on the agenda is um, <clears throat> appointing a vice chairperson to run the meeting tonight. So I was hoping somebody would be willing to make a motion. I would like to move that Andre be the vice chair in which he expressed interest, um, I think, during the July 12th meeting. Okay, is there a second? We'll second that motion. Thank you. Um, is there any discussion or would anybody else like to make a nomination? Okay, hearing none, um, Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. And Andre? Aye. Okay. So, so thank you. Said I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to turn it over to Andre. Thank you, Andre. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Alex, Bruce, and Jason. Uh, Jason, welcome, and um, it's good to uh, good to see you here. Um, I'll try my best uh, to uh, to. Keep things uh, moving along and uh, and going straight. So um, we have a fairly light agenda for tonight. Um, we're I think we're uh, we have two hearings um, and one that's uh, going to be uh, uh, another one that's going to be uh, postponed. Uh, that'll be. Um, 52 Faring Street for anyone who's watching and uh, looking to uh, attend the hearing for 52 Faring Street. It is going to be continued to August 23rd, uh, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. And uh, uh, let's see, um, Aaron. Uh, yeah. This is, you have the chair, uh, you have the... Uh, you have it now for uh, land management updates, et cetera. Sure. So um, Dave um, isn't going to be here tonight. Um, we have a ton of stuff going on sort of in the land management um, area. Uh, sort of at the, at the top of my list is Hickory Ridge. Um, and uh, we're right now waiting for some design work to be completed at Hickory Ridge. Um, associated with a handicap accessible trail and a multi-use path. Um, I might have mentioned before, but we have a comprehensive <clears throat> um, ecological restoration plan that's underway there. We also have, we have two grants that we've received. We've got one grant that we're waiting to hear on, which is the America the Beautiful grant, which we um, submitted a letter of support for, which is a, a huge restoration on the site. So um, we're waiting uh, on our consultant landscape architect called Dodson and Flinker to finish up the designs. And once the designs are completed, I'm going to be doing some um, crunching of numbers relative to resource area impacts and um, putting together a notice of intent application to come to the Conservation Commission with the full package. Go ahead, Bruce. Uh, who is the project manager at Dodson Flinker? 
Um, I've been working primarily with Lee. Um, Lee, and I can't think of her last name right now. Um, okay. But that's, that's fine. There's also a gentleman named Peter that we work with periodically. Um, but Lee is, I think, the primary contact that we've been working on with Hickory. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, we're a little bit light right now um, in the in the um, uh, staffing realm uh, because we have one uh, staff member who's out on uh, temporary leave, and we have uh, a position that's open for the um, uh, land. Uh, management assistant. So if anybody knows of anyone who's interested in applying um, to be the assistant land manager, uh, that position is open and on the town website. <clears throat> um, one thing that uh, Alex and I had discussed a little earlier this evening was, and this is kind of shifting gears a little bit away from land management, but um, I had asked Alex if he'd be willing to take minutes for the for the commission because um, it's been really difficult for me to to keep up with the minutes with everything else that's going on. And um, so Alex has been kind enough to do the last few sets of minutes, but he's going to be out of town and traveling uh, for the next couple meetings. And we thought maybe we could sort of um, rotate the minutes in the interim if anybody was willing to take notes and it's relatively simple. Um, what we'd be looking for is basically just the sort of general framework of the meeting where um, it's announced when the meeting opens, the general business that's discussed in very, very basic um, uh, sort of format, and then the hearings, uh, the subject matter of the hearings and the, the motions for the hearings, and then basically the motion to adjourn. So really sort of a simple, um, hopefully simple project and I am going to sort of assume that it's me but if anybody was willing to volunteer to step in Bruce is that you raising your hand Absolutely. I'll do it oh thank you so much that's awesome really appreciate that um Bruce you uh... <laughs> go ahead Alex <laughs> Bruce you'll have two examples which is uh, I reached back in the past for an example to copy. Okay. And um, you'll find it useful to go through the recording of the hearing, your own notes. Okay. And, and also the PowerPoint that she sends out. Those three things were very useful. And um, and then she has July 12 and July 26, which I put together, which hopefully she'll send out to the commission pretty soon and you can use them uh, as examples. Yes, and I'm hoping at the next meeting that we're going to have four sets of minutes to review and approve. Um, so we have an intern who's been helping us as well. Um, and he's drafted a couple sets of minutes and then the couple sets that Alex has worked on. So I'm hoping that for the um, August 23rd meeting that we'll have some um, some minutes to review and approve. Go ahead, Bruce. So I assume that our objective is to get caught up enough that we then approve the previous meeting every time and that we it's a routine after that. Exactly. And we're I'm hoping that we're going to be catching up on some of the past sets of minutes that that I'm currently behind on um, as time goes on. Okay. Well, I'm happy to do these two to get us to the place where it's more routine. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so if it's okay, I'll jump into a couple other business items that we have on the agenda tonight. Um, so the first thing is uh, on the agenda was a land use application for a, a peace poll at Mount Pollux. And I talked with Dave a little bit about this um, this afternoon, and he asked that we table that discussion until staff has had a chance to review it and discuss it and potentially talk to the applicant a little bit. So um, we'll we'll hold on that for tonight. Um, we do have a couple other um, other business items. One is uh, there was an emergency certification uh, that was issued for 51 
um, Leverett Road. The situation was that I basically got an email from um, Ed, Edmund Smith. He's a, a staff person with the Board of Health. I don't know exactly what the, the emergency trigger was in terms of like if it was a, a, a backup into the home or what caused the the issue, but there was an emergency uh, need for an emergency septic replacement at 51 Leverett Road um, as a result of effluent, which was discharging. Um, and so um, an emergency certification was issued um, for the new folks. Emergency certifications are only issued in an instance of public health or safety. So if there's ever an issue with public health or an issue with public safety, we can issue, um, I have the ability to issue an emergency certification, which means that work can take place within um, a 30 day window to address the public health or safety issue. And then um, the folks will get, they get a permit from me for a 30 day um, permission to proceed with um, um, taking care of the emergency. And I typically assign conditions to that. So it might be installation of erosion and sediment control, stabilization of an area after the work is done, et cetera, which was the case here. Um, in this case, there were um, <clears throat> there was a requirement for erosion controls and similar to what happens quite a, quite a lot with erosion controls. Uh, there was a black filter fabric silt fence that was installed. I went by to have a look at it and it wasn't towed in. So um, because it was a really, really rocky site, um, I actually suggested that they just instead use a, um, a straw waddle. And so they staked down a straw waddle and um, they, I went out and inspected that and it's all set. And actually I, um, oops. Sorry, just trying to share a picture of the location. So this is uh, this is the location, and the straw wattle was staked down in front of the fence. And I, the work has already been completed, and um, uh, the stockpiles were um, put back into the into the area that was excavated. So basically what I'd be looking for, um, unless anybody has any questions, is a, a motion to ratify that emergency certification. But I do see Alex has a question. Yeah, it's not a question. It's a clarification of the terms we're using. And the term is emergency. Mm -hmm. So what was just said is we don't know what emergency caused the, the request and then emergency certification. And just to be clear, under um, the regulations, emergency certification doesn't mean a house is burning or somebody's on the way to the hospital, that kind of emergency. It means expeditious. Yes. And um, it's issued quickly mm -hmm. um, and expeditiously, I think, is the, are the terms that are used in the regs. So it's a little confusing. Yeah, and it it can be it, they can be issued in actual emergency situations. Um, so when I was the the agent in Sturbridge, there was a tornado that went through town, and so there was a lot of emergency certifications following that for issues with debris blocking streams and you know trees that had fallen on homes and stuff like that. Um, so it it can be. It really depends on the situation, but typically within twenty four to forty eight hours, um, work begins um, when an emergency certification is requested. And typically, to issue an emergency certification, I need an order from somebody to do that. So it might be the Board of Health, it might be the DPW, it might be the town administrator um, or assistant town administrator. But that's kind of just a little bit of useful background information on these. And Aaron, you said in this instance, it came from the Board of Health? It did, yes. Yeah, be beavers are also taken care of typically under emergency certifications. So if there's a problem with beavers blocking a culvert or something of that sort, that goes into the health department. Um, and in some cases, it comes to Aaron, and that's an emergency certification also. And, and we don't really hear about the beavers. It just gets taken care of. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it, in the in the regulations that the I believe the uh, Aaron has the authority to issue them, um, which he does regularly. Yes. <clears throat> That's just background. All right, so uh, in this instance, you're looking for a motion to ratify this at uh, 51 Leverett Road, correct? Correct. All right, so I make the motion that we move to ratify the emergency certification for 51 Leverett Road. Okay, that's Jason with a motion. Second. Alex with a second. Um, Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Give a thumbs up for an aye. Oh, you're muted, Bruce. Yeah, you're muted. Thumbs up. Okay. okay. And I'm an aye. So I... Okay, great. Um, so our, our other um, other business item is a request for certificate of compliance at 797 Southeast Street. And I see uh, Virginia uh, Martell in the audience. So I'm going to promote her to a panelist while I do just sort of a quick intro. Um, this is a, um, there was a, an order of conditions which was issued at 797 Southeast Street um, earlier this year. Um, the project was um, uh, replacement of a, a line accessing a, a single family home. So the line ran basically along the driveway from Southeast Street um, up to the home. And um, I was out there today and I took photos and the site, um, I saw, you know, I saw when work was going on, but um, I would not have even been able to tell that um, that they had done the work. So I think it was um, a job well done. Everything was stabilized. Um, I couldn't even tell that that they were in there. So um, I will pull up the photos. You guys can take a quick look at what the site looks like. And Virginia, please feel free to um, clarify anything that I didn't say already. Uh, yeah, that, well, that was a um, good basic project description. Eversource replaced direct buried cable within the driveway of 797 Southeast Street by using horizontal directional drilling methods and trenching methods. So about the first quarter of the driveway was trenched along the edge of the driveway and they replaced the direct buried cable with underground conduit. And then for the latter two thirds of the driveway, they actually used horizontal directional drilling, which meant they only had to create small potholes along the edge of the driveway in which they could then pretty much slide the underground conduit in between these potholes rather than digging up the entire driveway. This entire driveway is wetlands <laughs> on both sides, edge, almost edge to edge on it. So we wanted to make sure that we were very careful about protecting those resource areas. Um, most underground conduit is considered an exempt maintenance activity, but we did need to install a new junction box and silo um, next to, because the wetlands go right up the driveway next to a wetland within about um, 20 feet of the BVW. At the end of the project, it was determined that they actually didn't need the above ground junction box. So they only needed to place the silo. So everything that they did install is now underground. The silo top itself is flush with ground and everything has revegetated around it. There was, it, the project went beautifully, honestly. <laughs> we were out there. Um, multiple times a week with them just checking to make sure everything was going well and it did so we were pretty happy with that on our end as well we did permit some areas of uh, temporary timber matting in case the crews needed to 
leave any equipment alongside or they wanted to make sure that they didn't, you know, accidentally get into any of the wetlands there. But as it turned out, we didn't need to use the matting. Everything was done from the driveway. So the, the impacts were um, pretty minimal to everything that for all the construction that occurred out there. And just for the record, there was a, a couple ongoing conditions that were um, associated with the order of conditions. Um, <clears throat> And again, it's one of the conditions is if the property ever changes hands that the new land order has to be informed about the ongoing um, orders of conditions. Um, then there's, uh, I believe, one about um, use of use of pesticides and one about use of herbicides. So, um, or um, uh, I think it was de-icing actually, maybe. So there are sort of our standard ongoing orders um, in this in the certificate of compliance well from eversources um they would not have any reason to go out and use herbicides or de-icers on that driveway at this point um it if the landowner does something like it's his driveway if he decides to de-ice during the winter which i'm sure he does that has nothing to do with eversource <laughs> um and, and I know that he actually tries to actively maintain his invasive species by pruning because he's come out and talked to us a couple of times. But again, Eversource at this point has no ties to anything that's going on on that property. They don't do uh, vegetation maintenance or anything like that along the driveway, so. Yeah, under understood, understood. Um, I see Chris LaRose raising his hand, and Chris is an uh, Eversource um, representative, so I'm just going to promote him to panelists really quickly so he can <clears throat> speak to anything on this. Hi, yeah, thank you, Aaron. It sounded like uh, Virginia nailed that, but I thought in, in case there was any questions, I should jump on as a panelist here, so. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions for Virginia or um, Chris about the project? Looks like we need a motion. I move to issue a complete certificate of compliance with the following ongoing conditions, WPA conditions E, 7, 8, and 9. Second. Well, we have Bruce uh, with a motion, Alex with a second. Uh, Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I'm an aye. Awesome. All right. Well, well thank you, uh, Virginia and Chris, for jumping on and addressing that. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. So it's now 7.29. Um, we have time for hearings, is that right, uh, Aaron? Yes, um, I'll pull up the sort of intro slide just so that we can cover that in the minute before the hearing starts, if that works for you. That sure does. Okay. Okay, uh, shall I go ahead and explain the, um, okay? Sure, if you want to or I can, it's totally up to you. Yeah, I can. Um, I've got it here in front of me as well. Um, so uh, we have, uh, we're going to go into hearings now. Uh, just before we begin with the actual hearings, uh, I'd like to make sure that uh, Everyone's aware of the uh, general procedures. So here, here they are. They're up on the uh, screen for those of you who can see it. But for those who cannot, I'll uh, go ahead and read it. Uh, general procedures for fairness to all applicants. Each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda. Five of those minutes uh, will, the first five will be comments from the staff. The next five will be uh, 
presentation by the applicants or their representatives, uh, followed by five minutes for public comment, which is going to be limited to two minutes per uh, person who is going to comment, and then uh, five minutes for the Conservation Commission. Um, all plan revisions um, are required by Friday prior to the meeting uh, uh, at noon. And just a couple of note, uh, notes here um, for presenters and uh, members of the public. Um, when you're going to present uh, presenters, uh, please clearly state your name, the address of the project, and who you are representing, as well as if you have a preferred pronoun or pronouns. Uh, for members of the public, uh, please clearly state your name, address, and note if you have uh, preferred pronouns. And with that, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, launch into the uh, first hearing. Great. So I'm going to um, promote Kristen McDonough uh, from SWCA as panelist. And if there's anybody else who um, is involved on this hearing, just go ahead and raise your hand. And while Kristen joins, I'm just going to pull up my notes on this. Am I going first or are you? It took me a minute to join in after you promoted me. Yes. Um, Andre, did you want me to go first? Uh, yes, Kristen. Uh, okay. So uh, we're what we're doing is we're having uh, the first five minutes for staff commentary, and it'll be followed by uh, your 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 five minutes. Aaron? Okay. So, um, Aaron, just point of yes. order. Sure. Our um, Chris and Virginia are going to stay with us. Um, yeah, so I think Chris has a, a later hearing. Um, I don't want to remove him because I'm afraid if I do that, he's not going to be able to rejoin the meeting. Um, yeah, so you can remove me. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So... Um, I think I'm just going to not share my screen at the moment because I've got some text in front of me that I'm looking at and we can, I'll pull up the slide uh, shortly, but, um, and, and again, I'm not sure exactly how you guys want to handle this, but it's, it's all kind of a big, uh, one big project to me because they're all very um, intricately related. They're all sort of in the same general vicinity. So, um, when we were out looking at the site, there was a lot of sort of curious topography and it looked like a lot of fill piles and um, like there had been quite a bit of excavation on the site um, with like mounds of earth that had been um, where excavation had basically been abandoned and, and uh, become overgrown with trees. And it made me very curious about sort of the site history down there. So I did quite a bit of aerial imagery um sort of looking at looking at historical aerial imagery to try to understand exactly what took place down there and better understand sort of the the wetland systems on the site and how they were connected um <clears throat> what i found or what i um interpreted from looking at the aerial imagery was that there was a a wetland system that previously ran through um, where Olympia Drive is currently located, and that at some point between 1974 and 1981, it appears that the roadway was installed, um, the Olympia Drive roadway. Now, just to sort of touch on that a little bit, I, I reached out to DEP about it because I thought it was um, uh, sort of a, what I would describe as egregious in the sense of like this this 
stream with a, an extensive wetland system that appeared to basically just be completely bisected by the road and filled in. So I was curious if there was a permit, a historical permit going back in time through DEP for that project, which I was able to get the historic permit log from DEP and able to confirm that there was no permit for that work. Um, I also inquired with the with the town attorney on it, mostly for guidance, because this is a really, really old situation. Um, and uh, I did share uh, some sort of privileged uh, advice from the attorney with you guys uh, via email and also in your packets. But um, I think just to sort of sum up what the comments from the attorney were, were that you know, the commission could pursue enforcement if they chose to, to try to rectify the situation, but the thought was it might be more advantageous for us to um, uh, try to promote some mitigation on the site and some restoration on the site in, in some of the areas that were impacted by the work. So I'll leave that there um, just as a um, sort of background piece on the history of the site. Um, so I, I issued this memo on August 9th, 2023, that also outlines that site history as well as the other um, parking area and some of the background on the other parking area. Um, back in 2020, um, Mickey Marcus from SWCA contacted me about a proposed site plan for um, the expansion of an existing parking area that was off of Olympia Drive. And that was filed as a category 2T um, project under the existing UMass order of conditions. And um, that provision, that category 2T was uh, minor buffer zone projects that fall within the 100 foot buffer zone. And so that was sort of the, the project umbrella. And, and just for, the, for other folks on the call who are new, um, this is uh, called a bundled notice of intent application, and sometimes for, for certain applicants, they'll bundle together many projects into a permit application so that basically it makes it easier and they don't have to file an individual permit for every single project that's under the bundled notice of intent application. So um, this project did happen mid-pandemic, and... Um, I shared the um, notification with the Conservation Commission at the time, and there was there was really no major alarms that it raised. Um, I was fairly new with the commission at the time, so just sort of starting to understand uh, the town and the existing permits. Um, there was, at one point, uh, Mickey followed back up with me and said that the um, erosion controls were installed, so I and he sent me photos and I saw that it was the black filter fabric fencing. And I said, would it be okay if they install some straw wattle or compost sock or something in addition to the black filter fabric? Because I'm not a big fan of the black filter fabric fencing. It just blows down most of the time um, if it's installed properly. And um, I got a response back from Mickey that they'd let UMass know and get back to me. And then a couple of weeks later, I got an email that the work was done on the parking lot. So that's kind of a little bit of site history. Um, the this this the, this project um, that's currently before us, as well as that project, were not identified in the bundled um, notice of intent application. But they the general area was identified in the permit as being part of the permit. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I'm just going to jump forward a little bit here. Um, so when we were out on site, um, doing the site visit for the, the new parking lot, there was a couple issues that, um, were identified, um, on the site, which kind of concerned me a little bit. Uh, the... The parking lot was really, really constructed really, really close to the BVW. Um, we measured five feet from the BVW line. It was also constructed within 25 feet of a vernal pool, which the vernal pool was not identified in the plan that was given to us from Mickey Marcus uh, back in 2020. And vernal pools in Amherst have a 100 foot no disturb zone. 
also just to note on the plan that was provided to us the parking lot was supposed to be 30 feet from the wetland so in this case it's it's within five feet of the wetland so it was constructed too close to the wetland um, also there was supposed to be six red maples between four feet and six feet in size planted on the site as mitigation i only observed three trees one large tree and two smaller trees um, and I did include photos in the packet for you guys so you could see what the trees were that I identified had been planted. Um, let's see. Um, the other item which I didn't note in my memo was that as part of the application, <clears throat> there was uh, an asphalt driveway which was supposed to be removed and that asphalt driveway is still existing so it was never removed as it was proposed to be in the original plan um i've already taken way way more time than i should um and as i'm sort of getting into the the meat and potatoes of this particular application um just to touch really generally and again um <clears throat> this is a public record so anybody who wants to see my memo is welcome to to receive it if you if you want to message me but um i identified a number of issues with the stormwater plan um there was missing information um so basically just running through that um there there's supposed to be a tss worksheet for every um, treatment train in the stormwater system and the only tss worksheets i saw were for two bioretention areas um, there were on those bioretention areas, there was no pretreatment listed, which in order to get the 90% TSS credit, you're supposed to have a pretreatment BMP. Um, there was noted in the application that there was a pea gravel diaphragm, which was basically the, the pretreatment system that was proposed as part of the stormwater system, but that wasn't identified on the plans themselves, um, like where it would be located and, and what the specifications for that would be. Um, there was sort of missing detail um, on the bioretention area. Um, there was a detention basin shown on the plan, but there was no cross section included for that. There was also no TSS removal um, worksheet provided for that. There was no pretreatment system that was identified to be associated with that detention basin. Um, th those are just a couple examples, but there's there's several other issues um, related to the stormwater management plan. And then as far as the wetlands, um, I I think that so I know um, Kristen put together some some numbers as far as alteration, um, BVW alteration. I uh, requested the GIS data for those because I'd really like to check the numbers, um, mostly because I think what's happening is that, um, you know, and, and Kristen, I I guess wasn't entirely specific, but looking at the individual parcels, we're trying to determine if over 20% of the wetland is being altered on the parcels that are affected by the, the project. And it appears that certain parcels in the project area ha are exceeding, potentially exceeding 20% alteration. So I would like to sort of dissect that a little bit and just see what the percentages are for each individual parcel. Um, and then we did um, identify that there were some questionable characteristics on the site that I think it would be helpful for us to have um, a second a second professional or a third professional get involved to, to just give an opinion on. One of the issues is that there were significant obligate species which were shown outside of the flagged area. And again, I, I didn't see soil characteristics, but I'd be interested to, to have a third party look at that and, and give an opinion on them. And also uh, a small wetland basin that was um, identified um, within the project area or close to the project area that was not flagged. So I think that there would be value in us having a third party look at the stormwater plan and potentially look at the um, the wetland delineation just to um, have a another professional sort of give their um, opinion on the the project. And I'll stop there. Lots of moving parts there. Um, just a. Uh, 
point of order here or a point of uh, procedure. Um, Aaron, I have not made the uh, public, open the public hearing for it. Unfortunately, I forgot to uh, do that. Is that something that I should just do right now? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and do that right now? Sorry about that, Andre. Okay, well, forgive my newness, everyone. That's okay. Um, so it, this is a, a hearing on a notice of intent, uh, SWCA on behalf of uh, University of Massachusetts uh, for the construction of a gravel parking lot and associated stormwater structures in the 100 foot buffer zone bordering to bordering vegetated wetland at lot 13 Olympia Drive, map 8D lots 15, 16, and three. Uh, there was a problem with the uh, legal ad uh, posting and the hearing uh, uh, needs to be reopened. Um, so here we go. Um, this public hearing is now called to order. Uh, this hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of wetlands, as most recently amended in Article uh, 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of uh, under the Town of Amherst uh, Bylaws. Uh, this and. Uh, this notice of intent, uh, as I mentioned before, was uh, submitted by SWCA on behalf of UMass for the construction of a gravel parking lot and associated stormwater structures in the 100 foot buffer zone to buffer uh, uh, to bordering vegetated uh, wetlands at lot 13 Olympic Drive, map 8D, lots 1563. Um, there was a legal ad uh, posted on. Um, uh, eight three twenty three, um, and we have proof of the butter uh, notification. Uh, there were site visits on um, uh, July twelfth and twenty sixth, and uh, we have some photos here. Um, all right. So now, with that said, and with Aaron uh, uh, Aaron's um, statement, uh, we now turn it over to. Uh, uh, Kristen McDonald, McDonald for uh, UMass. Can you tell me how you had to pronounce your name, Kristen? Sure, it's McDonough. Thanks, Andre. McDonough. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Kristen McDonough. I am a certified wildlife biologist and professional wetland scientist with SWCA Environmental Consultants, and I'm here representing the University of Massachusetts um, uh, to present a notice of intent associated with the expansion of a gravel parking lot called Lot 13, located north of Olympia Drive in Amherst. And the wetland file is 0890718. Um, I'm gonna just give a quick little background because I gave this before, but technically it wasn't an open hearing. Um, so this is a notice of intent for an approximately one acre gravel lot. It's a buffer zone only project. Uh, as part of this filing, the applicant is proposing an expanded gravel parking lot for students north of Olympia Drive. It includes about one acre of parking in addition to stormwater management facilities. There are three stormwater uh, facilities. Woodard and Curran are the project engineers and they did the stormwater report. The existing conditions within the limit of work consist of an upland forest forested with eastern white pine and red oak in the canopy with glossy buckthorn, multiflora rose, and bittersweet throughout the understory. Um, as Erin alluded to in her presentation earlier, SWCA did an initial site assessment associated with the bundled NOI in 2019. Um, we did a redelineation in the summer of 2020 as part of the previous administrative approval for the gravel parking lot expansion to the north, west of the wetland, and we did a redelineation in January, 2023. However, we double checked that delineation again in April, 2023, since it wasn't the 2023 January delineation was not completed during the growing season. And at that time we observed vernal pool activity in the Western portion of the, the wetland. Um, we delineated the boundary of the vernal pool basin at that time as well. Um, the project has been designed to stay outside the 50 foot wetland buffer zone uh, per the bylaw and outside the 100 foot buffer zone of the vernal pool boundary. 
Um, as Erin mentioned, she provided a comment letter to us. It's dated today, but we actually received it on Friday. And um, at this time, I would like to ask for a continuance so that we can have an opportunity to prepare a written response to those comments. I, I'm sure we'll be able to have those by next week um, per your request to have materials by Friday at noon. And I would, I would also like to ask the commission to wait on deciding whether you would wanna require a third party review until after you see our written responses. I think our written response will shed some clarity and address every point in that comment letter. Yeah, I think uh, I think a uh, a response would be uh, would be appropriate. Mm. Yeah. Is that uh, is that the extent of uh, what you were what you were going to state tonight? Yes, and I mean I'm happy to get more into the project and show the plans and and show more details and answer questions, you know, if, if this is the right time to do that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, maybe, uh, maybe a quick discussion among the, uh, among the uh, commissioners uh, to address, address your request uh, would be appropriate here. Um, yeah, in my, uh, in, in my view, I think it, it makes sense uh, to have a response from you and uh, give us a little bit of time to digest your response as well. Um, and uh, I think it would also uh, give us some time to, um, yeah, no, I, I, so I'm, I, I'm wondering what, uh, what the other commissioners uh, are thinking as well. Anyone else? Is there any opposition to uh, to garnering a response? No, I have no opposition to it. I do. Um, <clears throat> I just have a quick question. Was it, was a SWIP prepared for this project? Generally, SWIPs are prepared by the contractor, and there will be one prepared because it is over an acre with the stormwater. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bruce? Actually, Alex had oh, his hand sorry. up. Sorry. Go ahead, Bruce. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, mine Go is ahead. more of Go learning ahead. because I'm still new. Um, are any of the participants who are on the list that I'm looking at from the university? And if not, then is it typical or common for us to have a project that the university is in charge of um, with no representative of the university in attendance, um, leaving it to Kristen to, as the contractor to describe the situation? So I can just try to address that a little bit for you, Bruce. Um, I mean, I think it, it really depends on the project and it depends on um, the availability of folks. So there are times where you'll see a lot of representation and there'll be times where you don't. Um, okay. But I think uh, it it might be a good idea to have, you know, potentially at the next meeting to just address some of the stormwater questions in particular, to have um, it, at least the engineer um, attends um, to address some of that stuff. Absolutely. Yep. And we'll have we'll have the the engineering comments that you provided responded in writing as well. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, my uh, let me make sure I put my hand down. Um, my my comments go to the previous work not so much to the to proposed project but i would like to bundle them if i could for purposes of, of proceeding with this project and the first i'd like to suggest that we uh, consider uh, some out of uh, some mitigation that would restore the 100 foot buffer for the vernal pool where the parking lot was built uh, within the 100 foot buffer. And I would like to suggest that perhaps as part of the parking lot mitigation package, that UMass could restore 
uh, could pull the parking lot back and uh, restore the vegetation in the 100 foot buffer, that would be on the west side of the vernal pool. That's the first thing. And um, second is uh, for those mounds of dirt that we witnessed that seem to um, influence the hydrology. Uh, if you recall, for those that weren't there, there are huge mounds of, of fill that were piled on the edge of the wetland and uh, may have uh, affected the wetland. So I would, if we're going to have more look at this, I'd like to have a better understanding of what the impacts of those piles of fill have been. And if they did affect the wetlands, I would like to uh, uh, consider pulling them back and removing the fill if they, if they were put in the wetland. I would like to consider removing them from the wetland and restoring uh, the wetland from the previous project. And the third is there's a big pile of horse manure um, um, th that's, that's leaching uh, liquid. Um, I think I took pictures of it. Aaron, did I, did you get those? Um, I didn't get, well, you may have sent me pictures, uh, but okay. I have, I have okay. pictures that I can pull up to okay. right now. Anyways, I think UMass is using them for mulch. At least somebody was coming with their gator to, to get material, but there was a huge puddle of, uh, very sour looking water that was headed towards the wetland. And, uh, there may be a water quality issue coming from the pile of manure, which is I didn't measure it, but it must be 125 feet long, something like that. And it's probably 12 feet high. And it's probably that wide. And I would like to consider um, um, as part of the lot 13 project, uh, cleaning up the horse manure if it is leaching water uh, into the wetland and we and causing a water quality problem. Well, I can address yeah. your second and third point, Bruce. Um, so, and Aaron, you actually also brought up the topography and fill, yeah. and that's in the island. And just so everybody is clear, where that's where we're talking about, that's in the island in the middle of Olympia Drive, uh, which is which is south of the project area, south of the road. Where, where the project is, it's north of the road. So that's a that's what we're calling Wetland B. Um, the project is outside the 100 foot buffer zone. That's that's kind of off site. The manure pile is on another property north of the lot 13 property. I believe it is also owned by UMass. I don't know whether it's agricultural or or what the what the story with that is. Um, that's the all the information that I have off the top of my head right now on those. But we will be happy to address those and go into more detail in our written response. Yeah, could you bring up that picture again? Yes, and just uh, a just a point of clarification, and I don't I don't know which pile specifically um, Alex was referring to, but I thought he was referring to the ones that are beside the sort of um, area that was identified. This um, this wet pocket that had um, the water stained leaves. There were some really large. Um, yeah, yes, piles exactly. that were immediately adjacent to that to the north. Um, I think I'm, I think that might be what Alex was talking. That's what about. I'm referring to. Okay, that's what I'm referring to, but the the um, and I do understand that they're outside the they're outside the footprint of the proposed parking lot. Um, but it's all UMass, and if there was a wetland fill in the past. Um, now we have an opportunity, perhaps, if UMass is willing, to rectify the situation and do some uh, wetland restoration. And then, and then the, the horse manure, as you saw from the photo, is that big puddle of, of liquid, which um, uh, is coming from the horse manure towards the wetland. And the, the horse manure sits on asphalt um 
anyways, those, those are the three points that I wanted to raise. Thank you. All righty. Um, seems like a lot of, uh, like I was saying before, lots of moving parts and uh, we're also dealing with, yep, we'll get just one second, Bruce, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, that, uh, it, you know, we're also, uh, can't just uh, sweep under the rug the uh, this uh, past uh, violation. I mean, so we'll, we'll need to be addressing it at some point, uh, Kristen. So I think that's part of where uh, what Alex is referring to as potential mitigation. But uh, let's go with uh, Bruce. I was just going to follow on Alex's comment that there's a huge parking lot. On the other side of that pile of of mulch, <clears throat> and what it's used for, I have no idea. But it's a very big area, so it is entirely plausible that the kinds of things that Alex is talking about could be done. It's just there's plenty of space there, just conceptually. Thank you. Um, I think with that. Um, uh, Andre, Andre? Yeah, go ahead. Just for the record, I just want to be clear that I'm not implying that any of the three things that I brought up are an impact of the proposed new parking lot. It's just that while we're on the topic and working in the area, these other things come up, and I hope there's an opportunity to rectify them. That's all. Thank you. Aaron? Um, I was just going to suggest that we give an opportunity for public comment um, while we have the hearing open before if continuance is being uh, considered. Okay, let's do that. Uh, and is, is anybody uh, from the public uh, uh, here to uh, address to address us here today? Uh, raise your hand and uh, Aaron will be uh, bringing you into the meeting. anybody you're, you're not seeing anyone i, I don't see no anybody. no i don't see anybody raising your hand mm -hmm. okay well uh i suppose with that uh unless i'm wrong uh, we're looking for a uh, uh for a motion to uh continue is that correct yes uh, yep and we can give them a time slot at uh, 735 on August 23rd. I, I move that we uh, continue this project on August 26th, is that it? At 7 uh, 23rd. 23rd at 735? Yes. And I didn't name the project because I didn't have it in front of me, but it's 13 Olympia Drive. So I haven't stated that motion very clearly. Um, I'll restate it. <laughs> I, I move that we continue 13 Olympia Drive to August 23rd. Yes. At 7.35. Second. Okay. Uh, we have a motion by Alex and uh, seconded by Bruce. Bruce? Yes, second. Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I'm an aye. So the hearing will be continued until the uh, 23rd at uh, 735. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. I'll see you soon. We look forward to your uh, responses. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Okay, um, 735 hearing um, was, uh, I'm on the Huh? Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Alex, uh, if, if you can mute, please, just for now, that'd be awesome. I'm about to. I... Oh, oh, I forgot it. Yeah. Um, 
So, Aaron, um, shall I continue then with the uh, uh, notice of intent uh, by Goddard uh, Consulting uh, for 52 Fearing? Just so you all know, uh, this is going to be, uh, this hearing is going to be continued until uh, 8.23 at 7.30 p.m. Um, do we need a motion uh, at this point? Yes. Yep. We just need a motion to continue to um, August 23rd at 730. I make the motion that we move to continue the public hearing for 46 Fearing Street Notice of Intent to 8-23-23 at 7.30 p.m. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, I uh, have a motion by uh, Jason and a uh, second by Alex. Uh, Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? I'm not sure I can vote on this because I wasn't the, right, Aaron? Um, you, can, you can vote on the motion to continue it. Uh, you just can't vote on a motion to um, approve it. Okay, aye. And I'm an aye. So it's going to be continued. Uh, the public hearing for uh, 49 Faring Street or 52 Faring Street is uh, uh, going to be continued until uh, 823 uh, this year at 7.30 p.m. And lastly... Um, Andre, I have a question. Yes. Uh, point of order from Aaron. This particular project at um, Hearing Street has been going on for a long time and will be in front of us in the future. And we have new members who, um, what, would, what would they have to do in order to be able to vote on this project sometime in the future? And if they can't vote, we're gonna, we have a potential quorum problem. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a good point. Alex, um, so our new members aren't going to be able to vote on that project because um, under there's a, a a law called the Mullen Rule, which basically means that um, commissioners can only miss one hearing for a given project um, and still be able to participate and vote on it. So um, and and also because you guys weren't members at the time that the the project opened, it would preclude you from voting on it. So what that means is that we have a quorum, and because right now we only have six members, <clears throat> uh, on our uh, in our conservation commission under our local bylaws, we have to have four affirmative votes, so a majority of the entire board of sitting members, in order to pass a project. So. Um, we have uh, Laura, Michelle, Alex, and Andre who can vote on this project. And three out of the four have already missed one hearing. Um, I think Alex is the only one who has not missed one of the proceedings yet. So that means that um, Laura, Michelle, and Andre can't miss any more um, sessions of the hearing or they basically are precluded from voting on it. Um, but we can't even open the hearing if we don't have those four members present at this time. So it really is starting to sort of present a problem. Um, and it was because it was opened right before we lost two of our members. So we're going to have to sort of evaluate this as time goes on. And um, we might run into a problem, in, in which case we may have to close the public hearing and reopen it and sort of start over again is a, is a very real possibility. Um, but again, if we, we'll see if we can get the four remaining board members together to, to issue a decision on it. And that would be our best, our best hope at this point for that project. Um, with regard to the Mullins rule, could the new members go back and watch the video recording, uh, the several video recordings for that project? And with that, uh, you're shaking your head. No, okay. you can only miss, even a sitting member can only miss one hearing. Um, you can, and in order to vote on it, you have to um, 
certify that you've that you viewed the proceeding that you missed in order to participate. Um, but yeah, if, if if they weren't members at the time when the hearings occurred, then um, I would say that they should not vote on it. So it we'll have to handle that when the when it comes up. Yes. Okay. The soup okay. thickens. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So we have uh, our now to our seven thirty hearing. Was this? Uh, uh, sorry, that's seven forty. That's or? an error. Okay. I thought so. Okay, seven forty uh, no, hearing, which is a notice of intent, uh, tie-in bond for uh, EverSource uh, Energy, um, proposed equipment and uh, switch gear upgrades within. Uh, the 17K substation expansion of the substation fence line at 246 College Street, 14B 173, and installation of uh, 21 manholes and three distribution poles within the roadway along College Street from intersection, uh, the intersection of Northampton Road uh, slash uh, South Pleasant Street to 246 College Street. Um, I did get a chance. I, I was not uh, present last week, but I did get a chance um, uh, earlier today to um, listen to and watch the video of, uh, of the hearing before, which is why I was just hesitant. Uh, just now I thought I had just, uh, I was double reading it, <laughs> but okay. Well, here present, I see uh, Chris LaRose and uh, uh, Kate Wilkins. Okay, so um, Aaron. Yeah, are there any other members of your team joining you? I, I, okay, Sam, okay, I'll add you in. Okay, if there's anybody else who needs to get pulled in, just, just let me know. Um, so quick update on this. Um, I did, uh, <laughs> plug the project into our mitigation calculator. Um, and I sent an email earlier today to Chris. I also have the orders of conditions fully drafted for the project. Um, I think that the big sort of discussion tonight is probably going to be around the um, the mitigation for the in lieu fee um, contribution, which I believe is what um, Eversource was, uh, the direction that Eversource was hoping to to go um, for this site. So I'll, I'll pull up the um, calculator so that everybody can see um, the amount I came up with. And um, folks may recall that we um, we, Michelle, created, <laughs> created this mitigation calculator, um, which is basically it takes into account all of the costs that go into um, a, a mitigation project. And so this comes down to everything from acquiring the land to do the mitigation to um, developing a, a plan, which may include site visits to wetland delineations, um, purchasing of um, materials like like seed and um, uh, you know the the species that are being planted from a nursery, delivery of those species, staff hours doing the labor to install it, fuel, um, staff fuel driving to the site. Um, we, and, um, we sort of have a, a standard, um, I would say boilerplate of things that we include. So if it's a, a mitigation site, there would be signage that's associated with the mitigation. There might be equipment rental associated with that, watering, erosion controls, um, compliance monitoring for a three-year period. And these are all based on, um, the size of the lot and the um, percentage of the lot that's being altered. So previously we had a lot that I believe had like a 4%, um, or maybe it was actually it was a 7% alteration, um, but it was a, a smaller land footprint. And so that one was like a $13,000 $13, mitigation package. In this case, the um, percentage is smaller, I believe, 
uh, it's in, instead of being 7%, it's 4%, but instead of being um, 500 square feet, it's 4,000 or almost 5,000 square feet. So it, it upped the amount pretty significantly and puts us at 29,000 um, for the, um, the restoration. And again, this is our standard um, calculator that we use. So it's quite, uh, it's pretty far afield from the estimate that, that Chris proposed, which was about 5,000 for um, the in-lieu fee contribution. So I thought a big thing we might want to discuss tonight is the in-lieu fee contribution and, and how to handle that. Makes sense. Um, okay. Oh, it's not my turn yet. No, uh, the it's not my turn. It's not commissioner time yet. All right. So we'll uh, with that then, uh, Aaron. If you're uh, uh, if you're done for now, we'll uh, turn turn it over to uh, Chris and uh, Kate and Sam. Who would like to start there? I can uh, I can handle this. So um, yeah, there's there's a couple points, um, Aaron, and thank you for sending over uh, both that um, mitigation uh, calculator and then also the draft uh, order of conditions. Um, I think the mitigation might be a little bit of a longer discussion, um, but we had a couple of other uh, comments from the order of conditions that probably make sense to to breeze upon first, if that works for the commission members and a, a couple of potential talking points there. Um, so first of all, in, in general conditions, number 13, uh, it mentions no trash dumpsters allowed within uh, 100 feet of areas subject to the Wetlands Protection Act or the town bylaws. Um, we are doing uh, a debris cleanup. I, I, we discussed this during the last meeting. Um, there's debris that it sounds like historically was, was put in the wetland behind the substation. Uh, the planning board requested we clean that up. We'd wanna clean that up anyway. Um, so we do have a quote for clean harbors. It looks like they're going to be on site for two days. Uh, most of this site is within buffer zone. Uh, the way it works, there's a, if you recall the maps, there's a small square in the front of facility that is outside of the 100 foot buffer zone. Um, we can try to stage the dumpster there, but we would hope to, to you know, it, it would be close regardless. So we'd hope to um, maybe have a 48 our time window where we are allowed a dumpster on site and and that is for uh i don't know if you want to call it restoration but for for benefits to a wetland system yeah and that's our standard boilerplate so we can just remove that condition to allow you to do the cleanup that's completely fine okay and then um the second condition on there uh second one in general conditions uh condition seven um all construction materials stockpiles landscaping materials yada 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 can only be stockpiled uh in approved areas labeled on the plans um we didn't label these areas on the plans uh we would hope that there'd be the ability to stockpile material on the site uh either within the substation fencing or there is a fenced lot it's the same site but to the west of the substation there's an area that currently stages some piping and similar things it's not project related but uh for the project we would hope to use that as a staging area so we would hope to be able to provide the commission with a uh, a set of plans that shows that um and then you know be approved for stockpiling or staging there any soil stockpiled are would be stockpiled with our bmp so we would have uh we would have controls around the stockpiles. We'd have them on poly and we can cover them as well. Yeah, I don't see a problem with that. And then this one will probably uh, might warrant a little bit more discussion um, in special conditions. Number two, uh, it may, you know, this, this is within buffer zone and it mentions only native plants are allowed within buffer zones. Um, as part of the, the planning board meeting, it was requested we did a visual screen in the front of the facility. Uh, we talked to arborists internally about what the best uh, method would be for that. And they they determined that blue point junipers um, would be the, the, the best vegetation because they're salt tolerant and this is a roadside planting um, and they, they meet our height clearances. Obviously we can only have um, certain tree heights below the wires 
uh, and these are for visual screening. So it was determined that these would be the best option if if the commission is 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 very uh, strong on only native plantings. These are not native. We can um, look and, and request with the uh, planning board a, a native arborvitae, but um, but at least our internal arborist thought this would be the the most successful plant. I'll leave that one to the commission. <laughs> Okay, anyone else? Anything else? Sorry, before the commissioners get their turn. I guess the only other point to touch on would be the um, in lieu fee mitigation contribution, um, mm -hmm. if it's during our time to speak. Um, well, as we, as Erin noted, it's it's definitely a, a bit of a difference between the 29 plus thousand dollars and the five thousand dollars we proposed um, understanding that there's a standard fee calculator that's used for this sort of site um, I don't know if there's any considerations for the fact that 70 plus percent of this site is already degraded um, I don't know if that hurts us or helps us in the grand scheme of the calculation of um, mitigation contribution um, and if there's any way to kind of talk, about some of the parts and pieces that we could remove from that to reduce the fee from 29, sorry, I don't know the, I can't call the exact number, $29,000 down to a, maybe a more um, manageable fee, knowing that this area is, the characteristics of the site are going to change slightly, but the overall function of the buffer zone at this location, in our opinion, is not going to change. So I can just address the, I guess, sort of semi question in um, the overall existing alteration was not taken into consideration with regard to the mitigation. The the mitigation that was taken into account, I believe it was just the 4%, which is like the just under 4,000 square feet um, for the total site area. So that that is the only, um, I guess percentage or um, uh, unit that was plugged into the um, calculator. Just to clarify that, because it, it's not like we were asking right. you to mitigate for, you know, your historically altered eighty percent alteration of the buffer zone from you know the previous hundred years or whatever. Thank you. Yeah, if, if if I can touch on that quickly, um, you know, we know we do want to get this project through. It's an important project for. The town of Amherst as well, um, so we are willing to work with with what what the commission seems fit. Um, I will say when we did the initial uh, compensation package uh, for mitigation, there is a lot of that area. We we included the entirety of the the fence bump out, which is the majority of where the square footage is coming from. There's a little bit of square footage from arborvitae removal and a little bit of square footage from from pole installation, but pretty much negligible compared to the uh, the fence bump out. Um, there's there's a most of that is outside of the 50 foot no disturb area, um, but all within a majority within the 100 foot buffer zone uh, in the, the area is com comprised of both uh, asphalt parking area and grass vegetation. Um, so we, we, we in our initial package did compensate for both asphalt uh, just just as kind of a, a, a package we you know we, we, we included that whole area as um, mitigation um, just just. To, to offer that up as a uh, food of thought. Yeah, and I mean, I hear what you're saying, Chris. I would just counter that the the drainage on the site, like stormwater, isn't really being improved that dramatically. It's basically staying the same. So the substation footprint is being expanded. The parking area is being reduced. So there is impervious surface being removed um, and that the parking area is being reduced slightly, but there, there's really not a net improvement in stormwater. It's not like there's any stormwater BMPs being incorporated here or any real sort of net improvements to the site. It's I agree it's a historically altered site, but we're also talking a lot of encroachment in an area very close to a severely degraded wetland. And um, yeah, we sort of established the calculator as a means to be fair to everybody um, so that when a project comes before us that we have some standard that we input. And um, 
I agree because I checked my numbers and double checked them and triple checked them because I was like, wow, that's a high number. Um, but it's that's just what the number turned out to be. So um, but I don't want to ca capitalize on any more time here. I want to give commissioners and the public a chance to comment. And with that said, uh, I think um, it, right now, typically, it uh, it's time for the public to uh, comment. But uh, Bruce, if you had a question or whatever, no. Okay, so uh, if there's anybody uh, from the public uh, who uh, would like to speak, um, I see Alex over there in the, uh, uh, oh. okay, is there anybody uh, from the public who would like to speak? Go ahead and raise your hand and uh, we'll include you um, uh, as a speaker here. All right, going once, going twice. Okay, um, well, now uh, now we've got a chance for commissioners to speak. Um, Alex. Yeah, Chris, just point of clarification, when you were talking about removing the debris from what we think was a community garden, um, were you suggesting that the cost of that removal be included in the mitigation uh, calculation? Uh, I, I did not suggest that, but uh, that, that could be offered as, as potential. Um, we do have a quote from Clean Harbors for that. That's uh, around 15,000, which, which includes uh, almost 6,000 of which is disposal of the material itself. Uh, they also budgeted two days on site for doing the work. Um, if, if, if the commission feels that you know that's something that that would be uh, justifiable. I could certainly send that uh, the proposal that they provided over. Yeah, and just a point of clarification: on July twenty sixth, that wasn't something that we asked for. That was something you offered. But yeah, I that was actually uh, identified during a site walk with the planning board, and uh, yeah, it went from it, it spawned from that. Yeah, I understand that. And uh, and you said the cost of the cleanup is what? It's it's around it's fifteen thousand something. I I'll pull it up right now. Give me one. Uh, never second. mind. Never mind. Just looking for a ballpark. Um, I missed the site visit, and as much as I've looked at the drawings and driven by, um, would it be possible? for us to visit the site again. We have a couple of new members. Um, I, 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 don't, I would benefit, I don't know if others would, or whether Jen thinks, uh, Aaron thinks that that would be worthwhile. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. If we're if we're gonna um, hold out and do a plan revision for, I mean, I guess we can talk about it, but if, if we're gonna hold out and do a plan revision to include the stockpile location, um, I think that would be great. And I also love the idea of incorporating the mitigation that Eversource is already paying for. So, um, you know, that would bring potentially the mitigation down to about 14,703, which might be a little more um, of a uh, yeah. kind of middle ground. Yeah, and the third, third thing, um... Uh, I, I wanted to, I know you wanted to go to in lieu mitigation, but from a process standpoint, the first thing we try to do is avoid, second is minimize, and if that's not possible, then go to some sort of compensation. And I understand that the, the wetland is degraded because of things that happened in the past. And I wonder if there is an opportunity for uh, some work to be done in the existing wetland to improve it uh, um, and would like to consider that prior to an in lieu mitigation package. And I'm, I'm again, not familiar with the site, Aaron is, um, so I, I don't have uh, a strong basis for what I just said because I don't, I haven't actually walked the wetland. I've just seen pictures of it. 
but that was that was my third point is whether or not there's opportunity to improve the existing wetland which has been historically degraded thank you all right lots of hands up uh here um we're we're looking for a uh response here kate why don't you go ahead and and then we're going to go with bruce who's uh uh had his physical hand up for uh, <laughs> we'll put and then i'll take the end so sorry bruce um just uh knowing that if we do have to come back and provide a plan revision or uh, further discussion on the the restoration or potential restoration of the existing wetlands um they are currently working in College Street and moving down College Street towards the substation with the distribution and portions of that project are waiting for this order. I understand that's not anybody here's problem um, at this point in time, but um, once this order uh, does hopefully get issued, they can continue down College Street to go in front of the substation and continue the installation. So I know that they're chomping at the bit a little bit um, to kind of keep moving forward, um, but also understanding that the commission needs to get the full grasp of, of what they're doing. But if there's any consideration for kind of hoping to keep the project moving forward, that's that's all I wanted to add. College Street was closed today. Yeah, trying to hopefully get as much done before kids come back and all of that fun happens. As requested by the, the college in the common to, to try to do that over summer break yep. in that area. All right. Uh, Bruce? Uh, I yield to Jason. Jason? Thanks, Bruce. Um, <clears throat> it was mentioned that there's no stormwater, permanent stormwater BMPs. Can you explain why there are no permanent stormwater BMPs on this project? So the, the stormwater... Uh, there was a stormwater plan um, that was provided during the last meeting. Uh, stormwater is not expected to be altered by this project. So um, ultimately, uh, we're removing some impervious, putting in gravel, but uh, but the numbers remained uh, almost identical. Okay. And so, you know, Alex, I believe, mentioned potentially um, working in the wetland that's already been impacted um is there any is there any conversation or is there any mechanism by which we can have this conversation to potentially add a stormwater permanent stormwater bmp um, to address some of the stormwater runoff that is coming off of the site so uh, I'm just going to jump in here. Um, so Jason, on a redevelopment site, um, as long as they're not exceeding the pre-development runoff calculation there, so on a redevelopment project, you can't exceed the existing site runoff. So in this case, because they're balancing it, they're removing some of the, um, the pavement and sort of in exchange for expanding the substation they're basically saying that their numbers balance out and that they're not increasing the the flows so it's kind of a tricky um if, under the regulations like on a on a new site where it's a you know a site that's say currently forested and they're proposing a new development we have quite a bit more leeway requiring them to implement a full stormwater management plan but in this case where it's a redevelopment site it's a little bit more challenging um, for us to to require that. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I put that out there. Understood. And I guess what I'm asking is more of a rather than us requiring it, um, you know, if we're looking at this in Luffy and other potential uh, solutions to the issue, um, is that something that can be voluntarily done? It would, come, yeah, it would I, certainly come with the cost of, you know, the cost to implement it and the cost to maintain it. Um, just I, as I, a potential solution. Right. Yeah. I, I don't exactly know what that would look like here. Um, so we're, we're, we're talking about degradation. And I think that being a substation, that probably puts us in the focal point. But this, this is operating, um, it is a wetland, but it operates on that eastern side 
kind of like a drainage swale. Uh, and it's collecting water from apartment complexes to the north that funnel through the wetland system and into that. And then an auto body shop on the other side. Um, it's not a very healthy system. I mean, if there was, if there was, uh, it, we can discuss maybe a, a possibility of, of, of trying to help, uh, at least on our property, uh, mitigate that. But, um, but I, I'm not sure that would have uh, much of an effect on the system as a whole. Kate, I don't, I don't know if you have uh, any idea on that. Yeah, as we sit here, I'm trying to think of some potential options for both improvements to the system without causing even more uh, damage to it currently and any sort of uh, stormwater BMPs, uh, swales or anything that could go along the side of the um, without putting in a full underground underground stormwater basin, if there's anything we can do to help um, any sort of stormwater coming off the parking lot area into that system. You do have the vegetated buffer between the parking lot and the vegetated channel that's there, um, but also trying to, would any installation of another BMP put us into more impact area within the buffer zone also? Okay. Bruce? Um, very quick question. Let's see, am I on? Yep. Um, we've, there's been a number of passing references to the historic damage. When was the substation originally built? I believe uh, I, um, in the early 1900s, 1908, 1910, um, based on one of the phase one reports written for the substation in the early 80s and um, well, the late 80s, early 90s, when um, the DPW actually experienced some contamination while installing the sewer line, water line in front of the substation, um, there was a phase one completed then. So I, I believe the early 1900s is what we have on the um, recorded deeds as well. Okay. So if it's okay, I'm just going to jump in here because I, I want to sort of try to focus us in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Jason, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Chris, do you have the total exact amount for the um, Blue Harbors quote on the <laughs> wetland restoration project in the back? And you're on mute, by the way. Thank you. Sorry about that. It's okay. getting late for me. Um, yeah, it was sixteen thousand twenty dollars and twenty cents for the clean harbors quote. Sixteen twenty and twenty cents. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, so I guess this is just a question to EverSource. the The total that the mitigation calculator came up with was twenty nine thousand seven hundred and three dollars and ten cents. So if I subtract the um, sixteen thousand and twenty dollars and twenty cents from that what that leaves us with is thirteen thousand six hundred and eighty two dollars and ninety cents so it's basically what we would estimate um, as our um, in lieu fee amount minus the wetland restoration that you're doing in the back is that thirteen thousand six hundred and eighty two dollars and ninety cents something that's um more reasonable from your perspective, or is that something you would want to go back and check with and see if that was acceptable? No, I think from our perspective, that would be reasonable. Um, absolutely. Uh, okay. it, and again, I, I agree that we don't all, you know, we're, we're not trying to do this in Luffy to, um, to avoid doing work here. I just, it is an active substation. Uh, it, it's, it's multiple properties are, um, are, yeah. are, are causing this to, to be a little bit of a degraded system. We, we do think that the money would be spent or better spent uh, on, on elsewhere. Understood. Um, and then just coming back to the commission, what is the commission's feeling on the um, non-native species as the visual barrier in the front of the property? Um, because that's kind of a standard that the commission always requires. And is that something that <clears throat> the commission really wants to stand firm on? Um, cause I think that these, these two issues are kind of like the, what I see as the primary sticking points on issuing the order tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, 
uh, personally, I'd, I'd like to know what else was considered. I know that you mentioned that uh, that it's most feasible, uh, or I don't recall your exact wording, but um, what other possibilities would there be? Yeah. For plantings, you mean, Andre? Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. As, as far as plantings in the front of the substation for visual yeah. screening. Yeah. So um, uh, the I, off the top of my head, I, I'm not exactly sure the arborist went through a list. Um, they have to be under 30 feet. So there's the Blue Point Juniper. Uh, there's other evergreens um, and arborvitaes. So there is a native arborvitae, which does would qualify for our height and should um, should present a visual screen. I, I don't know the name off the top of my head. I apologize, but um, but it's a native arborvitae. It was just considered to be less tolerant to salt. Um, we can dig that up uh, for you, you know, momentarily if if you can bear with us for a second. But uh, but that was coming from our ar arborist. Uh, so we we recommended that to the planning board. They agreed. I think if there's any um, pushback from the commission, uh, I I don't see that being an issue. I think if if you know if the, the planning board would be happy to take you know. What, whatever you felt was uh, proper into consideration, but our internal arborist thought that was the best way to get the best visual screen. You know, and that obviously was the intentions of that planting. It's not, um, it's not adding to the health of the system. It's, it's really just a, a, just that a visual, a visual screen. Is that planting outside the 100 foot buffer of the wetland? It is not. It goes, so some of it uh, it does extend outside of the the buffer, but it's it's it would um, it'd be behind the curbing, so it'd be like a curb planting, a tree belt planting, uh, which which um, a, a portion of would be within 100 foot buffer. So, zone. so it's not being proposed as mitigation; it's being proposed as a visual barrier. Yes, it's not. It, yeah, we're not counting that as mitigation at all. It's just a visual barrier uh, as requested by the planning board. Uh, you know, for, for a screening tool on the substation. Do you, do you, I don't know what a, what that juniper would look like. Do you, does anybody, I don't, I don't have a book. I can go and look it up right now. I guess I could go online, but well, I mean, we, I think... don't, we do have a rule, which our chair is pretty firm on. Um, if that, if that is one of the things that's holding us back, um, maybe we could settle that tonight. Do you guys want to do a poll and see who's yeah. okay or not okay with a native species? Yeah, how about a, a or just a brief uh, discussion? I mean, if uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm one who likes to stick to rules where we can um, because because they, they have a reason. Um, but I'll also say that if it's, that if the wetland is so degraded, uh, perhaps, um, perhaps, you know, what we have on one hand is uh, having a, uh, having native species and on the other hand, uh, um, having something that's going to remain in place uh, as requested or required by uh, the planning board. Um, that's kind of a, a something to, to weigh out, Bruce. You're muted, Bruce. Given the context, I think we should just accept what the planning board has already accepted. Yeah, I'm trying to dig up from the planning board submission. It's just um, there was a lot of back and forth with the planning board in um, the determining of what plantings to use. So I know that whatever we chose was submitted and approved upon already. I'm just having difficulty finding it. Yeah. So um, I can go. I can agree with you, Bruce. I'm sorry. I'm before I. Alex. I I agree with you on the on the rules. Um, sometimes it's um, I would I would say if 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 we had to 
had to do something is probably better to stick with what we normally require and that is native plants. Well, the, the worry about height and um, whatnot of the chosen plantings was um, brought up because of you know safety reasons and the um, height of the existing lines that go right up across the substation. Some of those will be relocated with the distribution project, but the ones that are connected to those uh, monopoles in front of the substation are something that we need to maintain a specific distance from. Yeah, as much as I don't like Harbor Whitey. <laughs> Jason, do you want to weigh the in? Gonna, the juniper is going to look very, very similar to a uh, Harbor Vita. They're very, very similar. <clears throat> I, yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I just, I, I think at this point, if the planning commission or the planning, if they've accepted it, then uh, and then I think we ought to as well. I'll, I'll side with uh, with that as well. Um, just as for for a general poll, if you would, I think that's fine. I think uh, working we're we're working through a few things here. Um, are you what? Sorry, and can you say what what is the number of these? How many of these plants are going in? I will have to look into that too. We did provide a planting plan. It's um, Sam. Do you do you know off the top of your head? I can pull that up, but I I don't know off the top of my head. No, I can only find the proposed fence detail that doesn't have it. Um, let's see. Oh, just... I know that we're including plantings um, along the front, allowing access in that front gate. There are two gates that need to have access. Um, so we'll provide a screen except for where the gate is. So uh, just for clarification, what did the planning board approve? It would be a blue point juniper. And looking at this, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on one side of the gra uh, the driveway access, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on the other. So 15 total. If it's helpful at all, I can share a screen share a figure that shows the location if anybody. Would like to see those yeah that would be helpful so here's here's i guess the the challenge with this is that we need four to vote in favor of this in order to pass it um so a majority of the the sitting members um so if the board members are to consider this we would have to be a um unanimous decision approving it um just want to put that out there. So mm -hmm. this side here where my cursor is would be where the eight are located. And what was the other number, Chris? Seven. So seven on this side here. And there's a access point here, access point on this side. This is where the extension is going to bump out to. This area here is where the plan for any sort of staging or stockpiling would take place. So from College Street, everything, that whole red line, you can see through that. Yes. There's no, there's no visual barrier there. Right. There's currently no visual barrier at this location. It was um, the, the, the planning board added that onto their The review. planning board wanted you to put a visual barrier just at the entrance point and not the, not the rest of it? I believe so. There's, uh, there's some along here. You can see there's some existing yeah. evergreen here, but mm -hmm. nothing in front of the existing building and then nothing right here in front of the existing parking lot. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. You... As much as I've driven by that site, I don't have it burned into my <laughs> brain. Um... We can go to Street View if we if that might bring some clarity. I have I have photos of the site too. I can I could pull up. I just don't um it's it's I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't need that. I, it seems like a fairly small point that we're talking about, um, and it's taking a lot of time. Who, uh, who's sorry? Who's disagreeing with the uh, 
Who would who would like to see the natives? I I would like to see them, but I'm uh, I'm willing to go with the non-native uh, on such a uh, small or on or on this uh, in this situation. Mm -hmm. So I I'd go for it. I I would be willing to go for the with the flow. Okay, so I believe that that gives us a, a unanimous decision then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, that's great. Um, so I think on the conditions, so I drafted the order conditions. I shared those with everybody. I'm completely comfortable with the um, condition number 13 being removed to account accommodate for the wetland cleanup that's taking place and the fact that they need a dumpster and um, number seven um, that there be a revised staging plan that's submitted to us that that shows that the staging area will be located in that large parking lot that Kate um, pointed out in the um, area that's to the west of the uh, substation expansion area. Uh, it sounds like everybody is willing to sort of make an exception for the um, uh, salt uh, sensitive species that are non-native as the visual screening from the road and it sounds like Eversource is okay with the $13,682.90 contribution to the um, in lieu fee fund. So I would say unless there's any other sticking points from commissioners or Eversource that seems like we kind of have reached a, um, a compromise. Bruce? It's all true. I just wanted to, for the record, that you're keeping the reason that they are asking for the species they are is because it's salt tolerant, not salt sensitive. Salt tolerant. Thank you. All right. Hmm? So, I mean, uh, I guess unless there's any other questions, I can pull up the... Um, could you draft a motion? Yes. Um, just pull up. Page seven on the. Uh... Yeah, I'm just switching between screens here. OK, so um, I, I have it drafted here um, and I would just. Um, I mean, whoever wants to read this, but the adjustments would be to this that the. Uh, the adjustments to the drafted um, order of conditions would be to um, remove condition 13, um, that a revised plan be submitted per condition 7 to show the staging area, that an exception is being made um, uh, under condition number 2, that um, the uh, non-native uh, juniper species is being permitted um, for road screening and that the adjusted amount for the in lieu fee payment of $13,682.90 uh, would be substituted for the um, draft order. Yeah. Um, could you take a minute and, and type it up? Well, I think all that would really need to be done is just to make a motion to approve um, with the special conditions with the the um, with the noted changes, uh, since it's on the record what the noted changes are. I'll make the motion. It's on the it's on the recording. Yeah. But whoever's going to do the minutes will have to. That's a lot to unpack, and it having done the the last couple of minutes, it's sure nice to have the motions say what they what they need to say okay um
while she's typing, um, is uh, is is Route Nine closed at the substation? Sam, were you on? I, I did not make the uh, the the college the our call this week. Sam, do you know if there was a detour at at the substation? It's not at the substation. It's still up by I think Sealy Street. They're trying to fill, finish manhole four at the moment. Yeah, I don't know exactly where the detours will go, but um, there there is no work going on down at the substation right now, and uh, there is a portion on Dickinson that they they may look to 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 nub into Dickinson Street, but uh, will not be able to continue um, until this is approved. Uh, so, I uh, doesn't really answer the um, the detours, but okay. Right, the detours are actually I think contingent on being able to get flaggers or police details too, which was a struggle at the beginning of the distribu distribution project. Looks like that's ready, is that right, Aaron? Yes, yep. All right, well, I will make the motion uh, move to issue an order of conditions for DEP number 089-0719 with boilerplate and special conditions under the Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection Bylaw with the noted changes. Remove general condition number 13. Revised plan showing staging will be submitted per condition number seven. Exception being made for condition number two to allow non-native salt tolerant juniper species and substituted amount for in lieu fee payment of $13,682.90, subtracting the amount Eversource is paying for the existing wetlands restoration on the site. And um, I, before we second that, could you we have to second before you can discuss? I second it. Okay. All right. I'd like to, that. Be, yep. I would like. Andre? Yeah, uh, Jason made motion, Bruce uh, seconded, and Alex. Uh... Discussion. Mm -hmm. So um, existing wetland restoration, what they're doing is removing debris. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's, is paying for removal of debris currently in the wetland. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not, I don't think that's wetland restoration. Well, there's fill, a significant amount of fill in the wetlands um, that they're removing, which I, I saw would... the I saw the pictures. It's uh, it's 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 not dirt. It's it's um, boards and man-made things. But yeah. to me, there's no wetland restoration. That's removal of maybe it is fill. But it's it's not. I would rather be clear that they're removing debris in the wetland rather than restoring it. It's still degraded. Okay, so just a um, you, you're looking to adjust the language in the motion to amend it to state. What about cleanup? Wetland cleanup. Uh, wetland cleanup. Okay, for the. Wetland cleanup. Is that does that with Can't it, changing that language? And Can't um Can't Jason, would you be okay with the amendment of that language? I would be okay. 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 So it sounds like Jason's okay with amending the motion to change that language to clean up instead of restoration. That's fine. Okay. Good. Okay, good. Well let's thank you. Well, uh, all right, then um Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I'm an aye. Um, thanks, uh, Chris and Kate and Sam and uh, the commissioners and Aaron. Um, this was a, a lot. This was a a, a, a slog, I would call. <laughs> 
it was um, good though we worked through it that was good yeah yeah that's uh, a, a, a good one for sure so um chris i did uh, want to follow up on a question that um came up in last uh meeting that i uh, listened to earlier today and uh uh, one of the commissioners uh, asked about um, whether there was an encampment there, and I'm not sure what follow-up you had on that. Um, did you verify that it was not a uh, homeless encampment there? Or? Yeah, I, I have not. Um, I, I did go uh, a, a couple of times and did not see anybody um, camping there, so it doesn't look to be occupied. I do want to go a few more times before they clean it up. I, I, I think that's probably the best route to go about it. We have dealt with this in the past. Um, if that is the case. It, it won't change. Uh, we're, we're still going to have to probably try to uh, to clean that up. The, 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 the What would change was the timeline. We'd have a humanitarian approach. We try to set up with uh, a shelter. There'd be, you know, it'd be a delayed approach, but the, the right approach, I think, in, in most people's mind, I hope. Um, but no, it, it currently looks like it's unoccupied. But uh, I do want to take a couple more trips out and, and verify that. Andre, what, what was said on July 26 is that Chris said that they were going to ask their human human resources or human services department to take a look. Mm, okay. Or get involved or something in case there was a humanitarian issue. So yeah, they, have, they, have, they, have, they, have, they have a plan. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Chris. Well, um, I think we'll uh, thanks thanks to you uh, folks. You guys have a good night. And I think uh, is this about a wrap for uh, for the evening? Yeah, I think I think we've covered um, most of the. There were there were a couple of correspondence in the correspondence folder that were more of an FYI, and we can we can circle back to those at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. Okay. Bruce, you're on, you're on mute. I see yeah. a Mr. Lipinski in, is still a participant, is there? Oh yeah, um, I forgot, we usually do a quick public um, oh. public comment period at the end of the meeting if anybody wants to um, okay. see anything. I don't know, Mike, if you wanna comment or not. I don't see Mike raising his hand. Okay. So do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> a second. We have uh, Bruce with the motion and Alex with a second. Um, Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I'm an aye. We're adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Have a everyone. good night. We adjourned at 9.03. <laughs> <laughs>